Thank you, Miss Kim, uh, for your children's message this morning. Wonderful kind of analogy if we think about our own growth and this uh, sermon series. We find ourselves this fall in this sermon series called Five Practices or Cultivating Fruitfulness. Hopefully you've all been reading your daily uh, devotional guides to grow deeper in these practices. We began with radical hospitality two weeks ago. Last week our focus was on passionate worship, and this week we enter into the practice of intentional faith development. Now as we ready our hearts to hear God's word this morning, we're going to sing a song from our sisters and brothers in Zimbabwe called If You Believe and I Believe. We sing this a cappella this morning because frankly, that's how they sing it in in Zimbabwe. Um, There are no words printed for you on the screen, but it's a fairly simple song, and I think if I sing it through once, you'll be able to kind of get the hang of it. Join me a second time, and then we'll sing it a third time together as we kind of offer this as our prayer to God to hear uh, God's word for us this morning. The song goes like this. If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come down and set God's people free, and set God's people free, and set God's people free, the Holy Spirit will come down and set God's people free. Please join me. If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come down and set God's people free, and set God's people free, and set God's people free, the Holy Spirit will come down and set God's people free. Let's pray it together. If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come down and set God's people free, and set God's people free, and set God's people free, the Holy Spirit will come down and set God's people free. We do believe, O God. We do believe. And so we do pray that by Your Word and by Your Spirit, you would set us free. Set us free from all that would encumber us, inhibit us, prevent us from hearing your voice this morning. Speak, Lord Jesus. For we long to hear your voice. It's in your name we pray and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Friends, hear the story from Acts chapter 2 this morning. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Amazed and astonished, They said to one another, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power, amazed and perplexed, they said to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, saying, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known among you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. (laughs) 
No, this was what's spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You that are Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonders and signs that God did through him among you as you yourselves know. This man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power Therefore, David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope, for you will not abandon me to Hades or let your Holy One experience corruption, for you have made known to me the the ways of life. And you, have, you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had swore with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on the throne. For seeing this, David spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, He did not be abandoned into Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised. And of that, all of us are witnesses. Being seated at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this, that you may both see and hear. For David, for David did not ascend to the heavens, For he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make my enemies your footstool. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has both made him Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation, those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day as they spent much time together in the temple, they ate bread in their homes with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. It's intentional faith development, first century church style. They devoted themselves. 
The Greek word is proskartareo. It's a participle, meaning that it's a verbal adjective. The word indicates action, but action as a descriptor of a subject. Furthermore, this particular participle is a present active participle, meaning it indicates continual action. All that said, it could be translated, the new Jesus followers were together, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And I'm struck by the intentionality of this newfound community of faith. I'm struck by their their perseverance, their persistence, their ongoing engagement in their new life in Christ. For the first century followers of faith, if faith in Christ were an arrival, it was an arrival to a school of lifelong learning, a place of infinite and inexhaustible opportunities for growth and understanding and community. Content and community were the twin combustible ingredients of what it meant to grow as followers of the way. Apostles' teaching, content, fellowship, community, breaking of bread, community, and the prayers, content. Faith is developed as these twin ingredients. Content and community combust to form just the right dynamic, just the right recipe for transformation to take place. But the word, the word that I want us to hone in on this morning, the word that strikes me is that present active participle, that verbal adjective that describes those first Jesus followers, devoted or continually devoting themselves. You see, it's the intentional of the intentional faith development where I find a word that carries the weight of the rest of the phrase, advancing the practice in a way that enhances, enlivens, and empowers. And to get to the devotion, to get to the heart of this strong and ongoing persistence, I think we need to move beyond the content, beyond the community, to look more closely at the context. That is, we need to ask the question, why? Why were these newfound followers of the faith drawn into such deep devotion, pulled into such passionate persistence, and enlisted in such enduring intentionality? Because, I would argue, of their context. Note, their devotion arises out of a context that is explicitly Trinitarian, that is implicitly communal, and that is whimsically fanatical. Let me unpack these words for us. First, the intentionality of that first faith community in Acts chapter 2 arises out of a context that is explicitly Trinitarian. It bursts forth by the Holy Spirit power of Pentecost. It's centered in the Jesus Christ stories of Good Friday, Easter Sunday, and Ascension Thursday. And it's grounded in the good providence of a God who confirms and conforms God's call upon our lives. Did you notice the show that the Holy Spirit puts on in Acts chapter 2? It's quite a show, complete with the dramatic effects of the sound of a rush of a violent wind, divided tongues as a fire appearing and resting on the disciples. And the most impressive of all, the wide diversity of languages spoken, an ostentatious exhibit testifying to God's deeds of power. All of this is impressive, but it's the language thing that really gets the crowd going in Acts chapter 2. Bewildered, amazed, astonished, choose whatever modifier you might. They just couldn't wrap their minds around this multilingual sermonizing from a bunch of workaday Galileans. So Peter stands, disturbed by the fact that he and his comrades have been dismissed as drunks, and he offers his own sermon. A sermon that reminds us of the reality that the Spirit may come indeed in wild and unwieldy ways, but that Spirit always comes for one purpose. That Spirit always comes to unite us to and with Christ. So Peter preaches. And in very little time, he centers the power of Pentecost in the story of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus Jesus died, Peter says, crucified and killed by the hands of those outside the law. But God raised him up having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Being therefore exalted, 
ascended to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you both see and hear. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made Him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter knows what any good preacher knows. He knows the key to good preaching is to share the story that centers our life and witness. Just give them Jesus, as one preaching professor says it. And all of this is grounded in the call of God, the God who does deeds of power in Acts 2.11, the God who definitively declares in Acts 2, verse 17, the God who attests to Jesus of Nazareth and does deeds of power, wonders and signs through him in Acts 2.22, the God who plans and foreknows in Acts 2.23, the God who raises up in Acts 2.24, the God who makes promises in Acts 2.30, the God who exalts Jesus in Acts 2.33, and the God who makes him both Lord and Messiah in Acts 2.36. And the God who in Peter's coming to Jesus moment with the crowd of onlookers, the God who calls us, the God who calls our children, and the God who calls all who are far away to God's self in Acts 2.39, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him, all of which is to say the newfound community of faith in Acts 2 enters into a practice of continual devotion, of ongoing intentionality in response to the work of the triune God, the three-in-one God who lives this divine dance of three-in-oneness, creating, redeeming, and sustaining the world. All of which leads to the question, so what? How might this explicitly Trinitarian context from the first century inform our 21st century practice of the Christian faith? Well, frankly, the first century church understood that intentional faith development begins and ends with the triune God. And I do not think that this is a given in the 21st century church. Given the smorgasbord of programming offered among 21st century North American evangelical churches, and the resulting evidence showing quite clearly that all these programs are not indeed transforming us to be more like Jesus, I think the conclusion to be drawn is simple. All of our programming, if divorced from the creating, redeeming, and sustaining power of the triune God, will not shape us, will not form us, will not transform us in the ways that God intends for us to be shaped formed and transformed. The great Methodist preacher, scholar, theologian Will Willimon says it this way, as one views modern congregations, many with their hectic rounds of activities, yoga, ceramics, basket weaving, daycare, one suspects that socialization is being substitute, substituted for the gospel. Warm-hearted busyness is being offered in lieu of spirit-empowered community. Here I am as orthodox as the day is long, my friends. Intentional faith development, faith development that can shape and form and transform our lives begins and ends with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But beyond that context that's explicitly Trinitarian, did you also notice, too, a, a context that's implicitly communal? This following Jesus way of life is no Lone Ranger way of life. Rather, it's communal. It both includes and involves others. In fact, 16 times, 16 times in Acts chapter 2, we hear the words all or everyone. It includes diverse people groups, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Libya and the parts of Egypt belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. It includes all flesh, both male and female, both young and old. And it includes you, your children, and all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. The story that Luke tells in Acts 2 is a story that refutes the great myth of 21st century North American individualism and isolationism. Faith is formed by a triune God, a God who is three in one, a God whose personhood is represented by, by, represented by community. And that God calls us to embody that God's life and witness in the same way. 
We are called to a faith that best incubates in the context of authentic community where we can hear God's Word together, where we can share our struggles openly and honestly and authentically, where we can receive forgiveness and mercy and grace, and where we can live in such a way that our lives together better reflect the kingdom than any one of us is able to do on our own. All of which is to say, personal piety, one of the hallmarks of 21st century North American religion ought to always push beyond ourselves into communion with others. Personal devotional practices, the spiritual disciplines, things like Bible reading and private prayer, while necessary and essential for their ability to tether us to the continuing call of God, can never replace the need for communion, the need for community, or the need for koinonia, that great Greek word reflecting communion between God and human beings and between human beings and themselves. God redeems us into relationship. Explicitly Trinitarian, implicitly communal, and here's the fun part. It sure seems to me like the context we find in Acts chapter 2 is whimsically fanatical. Say what you will about the importance of Trinity. Wax on about the glorious gift of community. The truth of the matter is that Acts 2 reads like a fairy tale. It seems much too good to be true. The final four verses are so full of saccharine, they make my stomach churn. Did you hear this? Awe came upon everyone. Because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Really? I'm just waiting for them to get out their cigarette lighters and start singing Kumbaya in a big circle. Everyone? Everyone in awe, wonders and signs and all things in common, possessions and goods sold and economic redistribution of wealth, eating marked by glad and generous hearts, worship and the goodwill of all the people. It sounds so wonderful and yet so whimsical. And so what do we make of this Acts 2 church, especially given the rest of the story? After all, in just three short chapters, we find the story of Ananias and Sapphira, a couple who decide to sell a piece of land, and much to the chagrin of the early church, they decide not to distribute the proceeds, or at least the full proceeds, to all. And what happens? Struck down. They die. In Acts 2, we have the story of the utopian church, but by Acts 5, we find that the church isn't so utopian after all, at least for very long. By Acts 5, God kills the first dissenter. And what's even more, even beyond the evidence of the rest of the book of Acts, the story we read about in Acts chapter 2 seems incongruous with the church that you and I know. I, I don't know about the churches you've been a part of. I mean, aside from this one, of course. I've witnessed my fair share of battle royale showdowns over what kind of music is going to be sung at the Christmas Eve service. I've seen political power plays between pastors and people that aren't all that different from the ones we see on C-SPAN done by our U.S. congressional representatives. I've known of places where people are embroiled in conflict, weighed down with the grief that comes from longing for a church from a bygone age. Communities made fragile and frail by the overwhelming sense of helplessness and hopelessness. Frankly, the Acts 2 church looks like a Norman Rockwell painting, full of nostalgia, but empty of actual, concrete, real-life experience. Say what we will about Trinity or community. How about it, Luke? What about reality? You've heard me several times by now refer to Eugene Peterson as my favorite pastor outside of Elizabeth. This morning, I'd like to introduce you to Thomas Long, my favorite preacher outside of Elizabeth. 
Long serves as the Thomas Bandy Emeritus Professor of Preaching at the Candler School of Theology on the campus of Emory University in Atlanta. Several years ago in the Journal for Preachers, Long referenced the great New Testament scholar Hans Konzelman, who said that the key to understanding Acts 2 is to get the genre right. Konzelman argued that Acts 2 is burlesque, namely a text that seeks to achieve its effect through gross comic exaggeration. And then Long shares this story. One day I was pondering this text with a class of seminary seniors. They were saying all the right things about it, how impressive it was that the early church had such faith and wildfire growth, how the willingness to share their goods with each other embodied the early Christians' radical freedom from worldly values, a freedom possible in Christian community. There was, however, a note of discouragement in the discussion. These students were soon to graduate and some were to accept calls to churches where in many cases three baptisms a year, not 3,000 a day, would be startling. They were headed for churches where, to put it politely, people often give less than electric enthusiasm to the apostles' teaching in the fellowship. In fact, it was more likely that they were in line for a church where Sunday school had been on a respirator for 20 years, where most homes uh, have a Bible around here somewhere, and congregational fellowship is restricted to 20 minutes of coffee drinking after the morning service and a potluck now and then. Comparisons were inevitable, and the real churches they would soon serve were coming up short over against this spiritual dynamo of a church described in Acts. Then one student hit pay dirt. She said, This text reminds me of the little mimeographed booklet that one of the old saints in my home church wrote. It was on the history of our congregation. And reading what she wrote, you'd think that our church was the most loyal and faithful congregation in the world. Every minister was wonderful, and there was never a troubled moment. Long goes on to write, Exactly. We had been making a genre mistake in reading Acts. We had been reading this Pentecost narrative as if it were written by some modern university-styled historian, somebody like Wilston Walker or Sidney Alstrom. But what if this passage in Acts is another genre, namely a local church history? One is tempted to say cynically that it is remembered through those rose-colored glasses. But it's different than that. It's more than that. Local church historians are usually people of faith, love, and most of all, theological hope. That is to say, local church history tends to be a description of a church's past in terms of its best hopes for its future. The local church historian describes a church's past not in terms of the cold, hard facts, but in terms of where the church trusts that its ministry and its Lord are taking it. To be even more directly theological, local church historians, whether they realize it or not, see the life of the church eschatologically, that is, what, when they are doing their best to provide descriptions of what happened in the history of such and such a congregation, they can't help seeing it in terms of a greater understanding of the church, a view of the church as a model of the kingdom. So they tell the story of the church, dates and ministers and Sunday schools and buildings and worship services and cemeteries and people, and it was, yes, but also as the church hopes and trusts it one day will be. Unmitigated devotion all around, all upon everyone the freedom to share all possessions, unbounded goodwill in the church embracing more and more people. This is the way Luke describes the early church at Pentecost. If Luke is a scientific historian, then the only thing we can say is the sad news that the church has gone downhill ever since the first Pentecost. If he's a nostalgic romantic, then he has simply exaggerated the church's history needlessly, giving us little realistic comfort in a hard world. If, however, he is a radical theologian and a local historian, then he has looked at the life of the church as it was then through the lens of the Spirit's promise of where it surely will be. As such, he knows that because the Spirit is with the church, there is always more to the life of the church than meets the naked eye. The Spirit makes the promise of a community of peace and justice felt even today and in the almost laughable locales of real Christian congregations. Luke has seen the ongoing life of the community, signs and wonders of the age to come. Intentional faith development, Acts 2 style, 
they devoted themselves, continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. To be sure, the context is explicitly Trinitarian, implicitly communal, and maybe not so much whimsically fanatical, but rather theologically hopeful. Given Long's wise and winsome pastoral counsel, then that must mean when we are intentional in faith development, we do so as a sign, a witness to the devotional community in kingdom come. Seems like just enough reason to form a prayer group, join a Bible study, maybe even attend an adult discipleship opportunity. After all, it's the kind of transformational thing that readies us for the final transformation at the great banquet table of heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. We give you thanks for the way that you call us, and shape us, and form us to grow more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. God, thank you for the devotional commitment of those first followers of faith. Thank you for grounding their their intentionality in a Trinitarian understanding, in a commitment to being a community of faith and in a hope, a theological hope, knowing that as they participated in those experiences, they were looking forward to the day to come when all wrongs will be made right. God, grow us, shape us, and transform us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And all God's people said, Amen.